welcome everybody. This is Jack Miller with T360. Uh, welcome to another Fireside Friday. Uh, we're coming here to the end of the month of August. Uh, it's been a fantastic month. We've gotten a chance to spend some time with some really terrific uh, leaders in our industry. Uh, and we're going to do that again today uh, with you. I have, as we've done the last three weeks, Kelly White, uh, our SVP of uh, T3 Talent is here. Uh, welcome, Kelly. Glad to have you. You're I know I'm here in Austin. Kelly, you're here in Austin. Yeah. So good, good times. And then I'd like to welcome our, uh, our guest today, which is uh, Stephanie Anton, uh, the Senior Vice President for Franchise Marketing Growth at Corcoran. So welcome, Stephanie. We're just delighted to have you. And where are you, where are you Zooming in from today? I'm in Austin also. You're in Austin. <laughs> All right. An Austin crowd. I know. It's the Austin trifecta so, today. Go Austin. Yeah. Yeah, and I know you moved recently. You, I, I remember watching you, uh, you. You went through the whole experience that this industry is all about. We did, um, and it had been yeah. a long time since we had done it, and it was, um, you know, interesting. You, you should, I, everyone in real estate should move every five to seven years because it is, you know, a nightmare. <laughs> yeah, you get to feel, you get to feel the experience that our clients go through um, every time, and you exactly. know, we not take it for granted. So. Um, well, our, you know, welcome to this series of calls we've been doing here in August with a focus on uh, women executives in the industry. And you know, we're, we're here to learn, uh, learn about your experience and to have a conversation about it. Uh, so you know, where we usually start with these is just you know, tell us a little bit about your journey in real estate and your journey in leadership and you know, what, have you, what you've learned along the way. And I know, you know Kelly will jump in, I'll jump in, and let's uh, let's learn a little bit about, about where you came from and how you got to where you are now. Thank you. Yeah, well, first of all, let me just say thank you for having me. This is super fun. And you guys, you know, we, you said you wanted to just talk about women and leadership, and I'm so used to talking about the luxury consumer or the real estate market or marketing, and, and so it's like, oh, you just want to know my thoughts and opinion. It's a little bit nerve-wracking, to be honest. Um, so I have to say, but it's it, leadership is an interesting topic for me because it's a journey right and it's i'm now in my mid 40s and it's i would say the last i think 15 years have been formative for me in terms of experiences and managing teams small teams big teams complicated teams um very simple things and it's been um a process but i i would say that it's always been kind of in easy for me because of some things that happened formatively. And so it's not going to answer your question about my journey into real estate, but I thought I would just maybe share a story about kind of where I came from because I think it's unique in the sense of um, I grew up on the North Shore of Chicago and I grew up in a community where I was a little bit different. And so I was bullied as a little girl. And my parents were, I think, really smart because they recognized that I needed an opportunity to grow my confidence. And so they put me into sports. And it happened to be ice skating. I was a figure skater and I took to it. I loved it. I was a competitive figure skater and I skated in the mornings before school and I took it super seriously. And what it gave me was the opportunity to learn how to work hard for something and then the confidence that comes from it. And then that sort of comes from the inside out and, mm. you know, to really understand how to take um, something by the horns. My mom was really smart because she said, you know, you can wake me up at five in the morning to take you to skating, but it's your responsibility to wake me up. And if you don't wake me up, you've got to pay for the lesson. Mm. Smart, smart, right? So she, she taught me very, very early on how to be, you know, responsible for my own actions and then how to work hard for something. And then really the confidence, I think, that comes with it. Um, and that has really helped me, I think, become a leader because I know how to stay in my lane. I know what I'm good at and what I'm not good at. And um, in time I've learned, you know, like I'm a great marketer. There's things that I am not good at. And I like to hire people who are much smarter at me than me to do those things. And uh, so it's been, it's been a process along the way. And um, so, but I've been in real estate now for almost 20 years. Uh, I got in, um, well, my father was a real estate developer. So I will say I've actually been in real estate my whole life, uh, but I got into it right after I finished grad school. And uh, it's something I, immediately really was very passionate about. And, um, you know, I grew up talking about real estate at the dining room table. And so it was an easy, um, an easy fit. And my husband happens to be a real estate developer now. And um, so it's something I eat and breathe and live every day. And, uh, uh, and I love it. 
That's that's awesome. So right right out of grad school. So this is your you're a lifer. You started fairly early. <laughs> I suppose. I mean, yeah. So I started. So yeah, it was 2002. Um, so right after 9/11, I was looking for a job. Yeah. I happened to meet a gentleman named Paul Boomsma, who is now the CEO of Leading RE, and he hired me at the time. It was GMAC Real Estate, and uh, I was high, I was actually kind of you you especially Jeff will laugh. I was the director of communications and internet, um, and uh, <laughs> and but it was fun because it was a wild west, and you know one of my first jobs was to ironically now that I'm at Realogy, it was you know Better Homes and Gardens was a franchise that. Um, that GMAC had purchased. And so right. my first job was to kind of go in and work with the Better Homes and Gardens franchisees to convert them to BH and to, to, um, to GMAC and to explain to them why they needed an email address. And um, you know, so, and then from that, I ended up in brokerage, uh, running marketing brokerage in Chicago. And then I was at Leading RE for 15 years and just really two months ago made the switch over to Realogy. So it's a, uh, it's been a journey and it's been, I've had so many opportunities to kind of touch every part of the business and particularly in marketing. Um, it, it's a lot of fun. So you're, you're the second person we've had this month that had some kind of technology related title when they first came in. So, but I think yours is, yours is, uh, is, is a more entertaining title. <laughs> Which, uh, yeah, totally. that's right. <laughs> so that's, yep. that's great. So um, Kelly, do you have any, have any questions about her leadership journey or I'm going to move on to our next, uh, next series of. of um, well, I'm series. just curious a little bit. We, you know, we know you've been recently in a new role. And so maybe tell us a little bit about what that's like and what the transition was like, because Knowing a little bit more about you and getting to know you, I know that you were at Leading RE for a long time. And so I talk to people frequently who are changing situations and haven't done so for a long time. So tell us about that and how it's been and what you're experiencing. Yeah, I mean, terrifying to make a change after <laughs> years, right? The understatement. Yeah. And a job that I loved and a company that I love and still do. And um, so making a change, deciding to make a change like that was upending my life. But um, it was really about an opportunity and the fact that um, where I, where I, Corcoran has just begun franchising. And so really in the beginning of 2020, this is, you know, a long standing, but started in 1973 and amazing, you know, success in New York and the Hamptons and Florida, Palm Beach. And so now to bring that brand to all these other markets and then to really get in early on and have the opportunity to build it has been um, really a blessing and something that I, I mean, how many opportunities are there like that? And the brand is just, um, it's such a fun brand and it's so relevant right now. And it's been unbelievably successful. I, I keep joking with the team, like I just got on a moving train. <laughs> and uh, so it's a, it's a good spot <laughs> to be in. But I'm also, I have two roles, right? So that's the one role at Corcoran yeah. and I also am overseeing global service for some of the other brands in the Realogy family. So pretty much everything except for Sotheby's. Uh, and that's also been a really cool opportunity because I'm working with the master franchises um, all around the world. And a wow. big part of what I love doing in real estate is working with uh, the international world and understanding how real estate is done differently and then following trends and behaviors and helping people learn from each other on what other people in other places are doing and then how they can kind of adapt their business accordingly. So it's been fun. I get to, and I've been building a team uh, and I like building a lot. Uh, so I'm, I'm a big fan. That's a, that's a big role. And um, you I'm know, one thing, it. yeah, you're, you're totally up for it. It is. That's a, that's a big undertaking. Uh, you know, one thing about you, Stephanie, that I'd love to share with the audience is I met you, I think it was last year and someone introduced us and then you have just been such a contributor and networker and inter, uh, um, introducing me to people and all across the country and just being really supportive. And so I'm curious from your point of view, being so good at that number one and thinking about how you can connect people, you know, what are the, some of the challenges that you see specifically for women leaders in our industry and what can we do to support creating more opportunities for them? I feel like you've been really contributing to my success and what I'm doing. And I'd like to know your point of view about that just in general. Yeah, well, Kelly, you've been an amazing resource for me. And I think you just have such great depth and understanding of not just the technical parts of the decision to make a change, but the emotional pieces of it as well. 
and that's that's hard to find. Um, and it's, it's now this is all like pre COVID I'm talking about too, um, yeah. right? <laughs> so there's a whole other set of challenges now. But um, I think you know if you look at challenges and opportunities and, and women in real estate, let's just talk about that for a minute, right? So and I love yeah. this sort of series you guys are doing because there's no question. You look at the statistics and the number of broker owners that are women. It's just an embarrassingly no, low number. Um, I'm particularly proud. Um, Corcoran is uh, much higher than average, and we're still small. But I think you know Pam Liebman is a very strong female figure in real estate, and there are yes. other very strong figures in real estate in, in, in women real, in, with within Realogy, which is also another part of why it was such a cool opportunity for me. But you know, having worked in places that aren't as um, leading RE was also very women focused, partially because of the relocation background and. There's just, it's a lot of women. So I've been very lucky that I've been surrounded by it, but I'm very aware that the industry is not that way. And, um, you know, I think that that's a challenge, but it's also a huge opportunity. And, you know, you look back at time, the 20 years I've been in this industry versus now, now there's so much more support and so much more awareness and so much more um things that people are doing to ensure that um, there are more, you know, minorities in the business, there's more women in the business. And it's on every, you know, obviously the agent side, we got that covered. But on the broker owner side, I think, you know, the, the programs that are put in place to help women take, you know, on and start companies and convert companies. Uh, it's exciting to see because I think it's a huge opportunity. Um, and we just need to take advantage of the resources available because there's tons of them out there right now. That's so true. Jack? Well, so I remember when you and you and I met, and I knew who you were, but we were at an airport, and we ended yeah. up in a whole conversation about this topic. And you yeah. kind of, I, I think you were, you, you know, you're, you're, I remember the conversation as you're like, hey, why aren't you guys putting more women on stage at the T3 Summit? Or what's going on with women it's, at your firm? And it was your a, little, a little bit. <laughs> no, but it was good. But it was good. And I think it, I think it led to, you know, a, a series of reflections and conversations. And it's not a new topic for our organization. We put out this list every year. And it's not because we like necessarily how the list turns out. It's just who's running the biggest mirror. companies. Yeah, it's, it's the mirror. It's like, well, that's, you know, if there's a big company and we miss them and it's run by a woman, well, we're going to get them on the list. So that's that's the challenge that I think the industry has is that it's it's not a it's not a it's not a made up thing. It's a real thing where we, yeah. we don't have enough women in yeah. those leadership roles. It's getting better though. It is, and I think the focus on it and just talking about it, just like anything, right? Just with with politics and with you know culture. As soon as you begin to talk about things, you raise awareness about them. And then people behave differently, and it's a process. It's just like you know, wearing seatbelts. <laughs> it just takes time. But over time, you look back and you say, "I can't believe we ever we didn't do that." Um, so that's just part of it too. Yeah. But I also think it's you know, it's on women too to speak up. And you know, if you go to the the Women Up Conference and uh, all the others, these amazing kind of women's groups, um, you know, it, it's on us to ask for it. The whole concept of lean in and to say, hey, give me an opportunity or I can do this and to not be intimidated. And um, it's, intimidation is not something that I suffer from, but I definitely, um, I work with the people that work for me and I have a lot of women that, that have worked for me over the years. And, um, you know, it just, I, I'm in marketing, so it tends to be a more female driven um, mm -hmm. You know, division and so I always do it the part of my mentorship is you know ask lean in I'm not going to necessarily know you've got to kind of raise your hand um, because you know that's a big part of it it's a two-way street yeah it's, I was going to say exactly those words I was like it is a two-way street and I think that is you know us as event organizers need to make an environment where it's like yes we you know we want people who have a leadership perspective from any background to be on stage and that that's the that's the environment that hopefully we continue to create at t3 summit and it just gets better and better so um but i, I appreciated you challenging me personally on that <laughs> because uh I, I i feel it's one of those ones where uh, you know i feel like i'm an ally but it's not always apparent from the outside looking at our organization and we're we've been doing some things as, as an organization I think to make that more um, apparent and to make that a two-way street and say, you know what, we're definitely about uh, empowering leaders of any, from any background 
yep. and especially recognizing that some outreach is necessary to get uh, certain groups who aren't as well represented more represented. So that's uh, so. But anyway, I just want to thank you for the challenge. Yeah, of course. Yeah, but it's also on us, right? Like, then that's yes. the other thing I'll say is that, like, you know, I get a lot of inspiration. There's, you know, from from unexpected places. For example, I listen to a lot of podcasts and I'm very inspired as a, again, from the marketing perspective from outside of real estate. And, um, and I think because real estate is such an entrepreneurial business, if you don't understand entrepreneurs, you're never going to really be successful man working in this business. Oh, and that's so true. My favorite podcast is how I built this or how I built it. I think it is actually it's a great podcast. Yeah. Isn't that amazing? <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's so good. And, and it, but it's like, if you're, if you're looking for leadership and, um, you know, inspiration outside of real estate, but something that's tangential, but related onto entre anything entrepreneurship related is in, I find incredibly, incredibly inspiring. Helpful. Yeah. And yeah. especially the women ones, you know, because they just, they, the stories are, you know, how they overcame challenges and how they just kept not taking no for an answer and kept pushing forward and were so creative in the way they approach things. And so it doesn't matter that it's not real estate related. The, the lessons are really, really, you know, the same. Relevant. Yeah, I've, I've always yeah. felt when, when uh, I associate myself personally more with entrepreneurs, regardless of class or background, mm -hmm. than I do with, you know, it's like people, I don't mm -hmm. think of myself as, you know, upper middle class or whatever. I'm like, no, nah, the guy that's starting a taco truck or the woman that's opening up a studio or something like that, like that's who me personally, that as an entrepreneur, I, I feel like I'm with them in that fight at whatever level. If it's, I'm just trying to get a thing off the ground or we're building a national franchise organization, you know, it's the same, it's yeah. the same thing, right? So. Uh, yeah. yeah, and that's what's so cool about working in real estate. I mean real estate agents, they blow my mind. Like I have never sold real estate. I have so much respect for agents and the fact that they wake up every day without a paycheck. I, I've always been lucky enough, you know, knock on wood <laughs> to have a paycheck. And the fact that um, we're doing the same thing in different scale is important to recognize because there's so much more the same, that's the same that's, and then it's different. That's really good. Anyway, tangent, but. <laughs> yeah, I know. It's really good. It's really good. Well, and maybe on that tangent, I know it's a little out of order, but who are some of your kind of mentors outside of real estate since you brought up the podcast? And I mean, I, I tend to follow people also outside of the industry and inside the industry too, just seeking knowledge, but curious who, who you follow. Um, so in terms of, in terms of like people that inspire me, that kind of a thing. Yeah. 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 Um, so women specifically, um, I would say, and I haven't, I haven't, heard what your other people that you've interviewed have said, so I don't know if anyone said this, but I would bet they would, but it was Mich Michelle Obama is a huge one for me. And I think the reasons are, you know, obviously she's so bright, she's so confident, yes. um, but she's also, she leads from her heart. Mm -hmm. And that I think is the most, you know, there's this sort of like head and heart thing that happens. And you clearly have to be smart to be successful, but if you lead with empathy and you show, lead by example, and leave with your heart, I think, you know, how can you deny that? Because that all becomes about authenticity. And um, authenticity is something, it's, it's kind of fun to see it having transformed in the, I guess, 25, 30 years that I've been a working professional, because, you know, when I started, it was, um, you know, it was all about being formal and professional. And now, I mean, here we are in Zoom in our homes, and, you know, and it can just, you know, I'm no longer having to dress, I mean, I'm, dressed up, but not dressed up every day in a suit like I used to be, because it's just, we're all humans. And I think Michelle Obama is a really uh, a great bellwether for that. She's, um, it's been awesome. inspiring to see her. And then the other one I would say um, is Christiane Amanpour, um, the journalist. And uh, I really, I have a girl crush on her. I mean, I just, <laughs> seriously, she's brilliant, but she's also mastered the ability to work on a global scale. And for me in my roles, you know, having the ability to kind of transform myself and work with people all over the world, that's a really important thing to look to, to say who has done a really good job with that. Um, I think she always just holds herself up with class, but she also has great empathy. And I, um, my undergrad was in journalism and I, that was my big secret. You know, I was, always wanted to be Barbara Walters, um, uh -huh. yeah, or now I really want to be Christian Allen for <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah, unexpected. But again, I always like to kind of look outside of real estate. 
Well, I'd, I'd love to know more from your point of view, just what it, how you feel about leading from the heart, how you do that. And it's interesting that your role models are really classy and intelligent. And really, I see that in you as well. So I'd be curious mm -hmm. about your thoughts about leading from the heart and how yeah. that shows up for you and your organization. Yeah, yeah. It's hard. I mean, there's been, I, I've cried a lot <laughs> over the years, <laughs> you know, because I think I'm a very... Um, sensitive, emotional person. And it's hard to balance that sometimes. Mm -hmm. I mean, I definitely, I, you know, at the same time, I have a bit of an edge and I can be sharp. And so kind of finding the balance between the two, um, you know, is hard, but I'll tell you a funny quick story. I was uh, recently, I had a, um, a, one, a member of my team who was leaving um, and it was her last day and we were doing a happy hour, a Zoom happy hour. And um, I said, how are you? And she started telling me all the things she had left to do before she left. I was like, oh. no, 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 stop, stop, stop. How are you? <laughs> and right. she stopped and she stood back and she was like, oh, I'm okay. And, you know, I think mm -hmm. that moment is so, it's so critically important to, as a leader, um, to be connected to people emotionally, because if you don't understand what's going on with them personally and emotionally, how can you really understand and help shape, you know, you're together eight, 10, 12 hours a day, right? right. Um, so to me, that's what it means is leading from your heart. It's also following your instincts mm. and trusting your instincts too. Um, not just about, well, partially, you know, about hiring and firing. And they always say, you know, hire slow and fire fast. And um, I'm not great at that because firing, you know, firing <laughs> fast is hard for me. Um, but I, you know, I also, people have to perform and, you know, so it's a balance of all of that. Um, but I, I think that also kind of plays into to my relationships with clients or, or brokers, right? And um, I think that um, building relationships is such a really big part of this business. And, um, you know, it, it, it really, um, Pam O'Connor actually was, uh, who was the former CEO of Leading RE was just an incredible mentor for me. Um, and I had an opportunity to work with her for I think 12 years. And she is legendary in the business for the relationships that she has. She knows everybody, but she has this incredible ability to remember everyone's names and their kids' names and, and then stays in contact with them and then genuinely, truly cares about them. And, mm -hmm. and so she, um, she you know, was really a, a formidable person to show me that it's okay to have relationships with people, and, but it's still professional. Um, but also, you know, she, oftentimes we'd be in a boardroom and it was the two of us and 12 men. And right. She was amazing at learning how, at teaching me how to navigate that and how not to be intimidated and how to make sure, you know, you're not just hanging out with women. You got to make sure you're hanging out with the men too and developing those relationships. And, um, and uh, you know, that was a, a big influence in, in my professional career for sure. What were the tips or tricks that she was teaching you in, you know, being in that environment? Any anything you want to share there? I'm curious. Well, she was always the always the last, the first to say, you definitely be the last to leave, <laughs> you know, and uh, you know, going out to happy hour at night and you know, incorporating the social things too. Yeah. Um, just be in the meetings because half of the meetings happen at drinks the night before or afterwards as well. So you've got to be in the bar and, you know, I mean, I don't mind being in a bar, but, you know, I don't know. Does our industry need coaching to be in the bar? I think, <laughs> but I hear the point. I hear the point you're making, which is don't, don't opt out of the social stuff. That that's, that's where a lot of the decision making. That's happens. where the trust gets built. And that's what I'll say. And, you know, if you're, I think if you're not in the room, um, not that people distrust you, but that's where the relationships really get built. Um, uh -huh. That's where you have an opportunity to talk more about who you are as a human and to make real connections and deep connections. And um, so that was, a, a, I think, a great tip. Um, but she also, you know, you know, was always be prepared and know, make sure that you know more, more about your topic than anybody else. And you know, be bulletproof. And so a ton of, you know, not just about drinking, like she gave a ton of amazing <laughs> professional um, pieces of guidance and um, also just watching her lead, you know, by example and always, you know, being the first to respond to things. And it was just, it was a privilege to have the opportunity to work with her. Yeah, she's incredible. Um, so any other female leaders that you think of that have influenced you in your career? Um, in our industry, for sure. I yeah, mean, in our industry. There's yeah, so I many. Mean, 
Yeah, there's so many. And I, I will say that I've had a really good opportunity to be connected with some amazing women. Um, Michael Saunders comes to my mind immediately. And so um, Michael Saunders in Sarasota, Florida. And, um, you know, she's been, she was a close you know, mentor for me for many years and really um, is a great example of being a strong female and having a point of view and really understanding marketing and having marketing shape her business. And okay. so that was just, um, that's been impressive to watch. Um, at Realogy, I'll tell you this too. I mean, when I first started talking to them, I didn't know much about the organization and I didn't know that there were that many women running the company. Mm-hmm. And you know, you just see John Payton, you see um, you know, Ryan Schneider, you see Ryan Gorman at Cole Banker, and, um, but, and of course you see Sherry Chris and you see Pam Liebman, but you don't see all these amazing women that are right beneath them. And, you know, there's, true. Yeah, there's Liz um, Geringer, who's the COO of Cole Banker. Um, you know, I met her and it was like, I felt like we were friends two seconds after we met. And she's just an incredible, thoughtful, um, amazing leader. Um, Tanya, who um, I know you know, who runs HR. Um, she's run, unbelievable. Yeah, she's and she's very, I think, visible in the woman up world. But um, and and you know, it's been um, it's been fun to kind of learn all of the incredible women that are in this organization and the support that comes with that too. So. Yes, I I do. I know, uh, you know, Amy Sheru, I think I mentioned her a few weeks ago, oh. having met her there and just Jen Marchetti's another one that was in BHGRE that was really There's the, the CMOs across Realogy are most, a lot of them are women. And um, Christina Panos, who's the woman who's behind all of the Corcoran marketing. I mean, she's just a brilliant woman. Um, and Jen Marchetti is a good example as well. And um, yep. And uh, so there's there's some great ones there. And then another one actually who comes to my mind too is a woman named Nancy Nagy. Nancy was the CEO of Canning and Spray in Chicago, um, which is now Berkshire Hathaway, Chicago. Uh, and uh, Nancy moved to Florida, but um, she she's remained a very good friend of mine, but she's a great example of a very strong leader and someone who is not afraid to tell anybody what she thinks in a very <laughs> diplomatic way. No, but she's strong, but she's, um, she's diplomatic and she's, it's still, she's mastered the art and was an inspiration for me on with negotiation, right? So she's mastered the art of making everybody feel like they won. Uh, so, you know, there's like two ways you can approach negotiation. One is that you, I win and you lose, or we both win. And that was an important thing that she helped me clarify because uh, I think it's a really helpful way to understand that negotiating doesn't mean that somebody has to lose. Yeah, I love that you said that. That's um, that reminds me a little bit, Jack, of Mo Anderson. Remember with the Velvet Hammer, yeah. like yes, you know, yes. I was thinking exactly, exactly the same thing. I said that right. ability to be direct uh, and get you know you need to get done what you need to get done but people walking out of there and actually feeling good about it and saying, yeah. okay, you know, like Mo, Mo, I remember having conversations with her where I come out of there and I'm like, she just told me I did it all wrong, but she did it so well that I, <laughs> really, I really feel good about it. Like I'm now motivated to go fix whatever it is that I maybe didn't do right or didn't do the way she wanted it done. And, uh, and that's a skill. I mean, that's a, it, it creates a lot of loyalty when uh, a person is that, has that capacity. And I think you just were describing that where, you know, people feel great when they've been led that way, um, even when it's a tough conversation. Well, I think women are uniquely positioned to do that too. I'm not saying that men can't, but I'm just, I think women have emotional intelligence. And again, not to say that men don't, (laughs) but women have the ability to really leverage that. And in business, I think it can be a really huge advantage and not something that, everyone necessarily understands, you know, I think it's funny too. And Kelly, I think you and I were talking about this. Um, I approach leadership a little bit in this concept of servant leadership. And if you read any leadership books, you know, there's sort of different leadership styles. And, you know, I'm very much a servant leader, which is that I'm here to serve you. And I feel that way for the people I report to, for my clients and for my team. And um, Mike Staver, who used to be my business coach. He's um, awesome. So lucky to have to work with him for a long time. But um, Mike, you know, he always used to say, um, you know, he kind of helped me understand that sort of. And he used to, I mean, he'd start every call, every coaching call with, you know, what can I do for you today? And I always loved that concept. Mm. Because I often say that to the people that I work with because 
it's it helps me immediately say i'm here to be of service to you but it's on you tell me what you need from me um and uh so anyway and then the other thing mike has always said to me and i, I love this and it's just one of my favorite i use it probably every couple of days which is he said you should never um never expect that someone it, uh, what is it um don't don't assume malice when ignorance will do <laughs> that's awesome I love that. And I will I tell you, too. it gets me out of a lot of jams because when I get angry or I'm frustrated or I think somebody, you know, is like out to get me, often if I kind of bump it up against that statement and I actually wrote it and I put it on a little piece of paper on my computer for a long time, um, it was just a good reminder to say, you know, oftentimes people, you got to forget, you're forgetting their perspective and you need to think of where they're coming from. And sometimes it's just ignorance and it's not, it's really, when you assume malice, I think, you, oh, you have so a lot true. more anger in your world. And when you can let that go, oof, what a relief. Right, because ignorance assumes that they just don't know versus that there's some malintention on their part, right? Yeah, well, exactly. It, it gives them an out too, where they can go, wait a minute. Actually, yeah, you're right. I don't know what I'm talking about. So it's, it's a very true. polite way of handling. You, you run across something and if you say, well, yeah, is that sure? Are you sure you mean what you're saying? <laughs> right? <laughs> that gives them the ability to actually have that moment and go, you know, maybe I don't mean that. Maybe I mean something else. It also helps a lot specifically in negotiating because when you're in a negotiation with someone, if you can remember that they may not be out to get you, right? Watch your back, obviously. <laughs> but, um, you know, keep, keep in mind that sometimes it's just about educating them on what your side thinks that can help get you to a place where everyone feels like they won. So it all kind of ties together. So I have a follow up for you because when you started talking about servant leadership, I mean, I, I read, you know, one of Robert Greenleaf's publications on servant leadership when I was, you know, it's probably 20 years ago, you know, and I became a, a, a follower of that kind of discipline of leadership because I think it's a very, it can be a very powerful style. But I think there's a catch there, and I think it impacts women more than men. And I'm not going to say again, no, no blankets, not true everywhere. But I think um, because of the concept of like I'm here to I'm here to to serve my followers, that sometimes you end up compromising in ways you shouldn't. And so, talk to me a little bit about that because I I see that dynamic, and I've experienced I experience it myself. I think of myself that way too. And sometimes I overcommit for people that I'm leading. And it's like, wait, they're, they're supposed to work for me. Hold on here. How did this happen? You know? So, but talk to us about that dynamic because I think it's, I think it's very real and I think it impacts leaders of, of all shapes and sizes. Jack, you bring up a really good point and it's, I suffer from it. And I, if, if you have a silver bullet, let me know. <laughs> um, but I think it's about being conscious of that and more specifically, and as I get older, I'm getting better at this, at this, which is learning to say no also. Um, so I can still approach something with, you know, I'm here to serve you or here to help or whatever the case may be. But um, I also need to start, you know, I've, I've gotten better at saying no to things also. So, it, and finding additional resources. So delegating is a big part of that. And it, again, all kind of goes around to the same thing, which is that when you hire people that are smarter than you, it's super easy to delegate. <laughs> and, you know, and you just have to make sure that you don't overload them because, you know, and I'll, I'll often, you know, take stuff back and then realize, oh, I shouldn't be doing this and then find out a different way to kind of give it back, but um, not as, you know, much of a burden because um, I do have the tendency to say, I'll do everything, I'll do everything. And then suddenly my calendar is, you know, 12 yeah. hours every 30 minutes and like you was like your call today your day-to-day -day, jack and so back to back yeah and so building in time for yourself and yeah. basic things like that um but also learning to say no and you know making sure that you have downtime and i've been laughing you know this the last couple of months have been really intense for me at this new role and i think onboarding in covid is a whole new unique set of challenges uh Absolutely. I mean, it's really, it's intense. And there's been a lot of Zoom calls and, um, you know, way more than I ever perceived I was going to have. But um, so I'm making sure that like Saturdays are like just a, a, you know, rest rest day. Exactly. Like post kind of like a big race or something. Right. It's yeah. Really. And, and they do. Pro they're, some pro tips I've discovered recently. Yeah. Schedule lunch. Put yeah. it on your schedule. 
I never eat lunch. I know. With, I'm the worst. With the Zoom meetings, with the Zoom meetings, the way people do scheduling now, you can literally be on from, you know, 7.30 a.m. until 5 p.m. With no, with no break or you're stealing a break to go eat, right? So I started putting on my calendar. I never had to do that before when you go into an office or in a time where there's not that expectation. So um, that, that's, you know, well, that's it's helped me. I'll give you two tips and, and really do just put this in place and they've been helpful. I can't say I've been able to completely take advantage of this, but um, we've put in like blocks of time that are no meeting time. No um, meeting. And yeah. yeah, and it's, I mean, it's not brain surgery, but it's super helpful because it's cultural. It's from the top down. Mm. And then we're also doing like our, our one hour meetings are 50 minutes and our 30 minute meetings are 25 mi minutes, just so that you're not exactly Smart. back to back to back. And then That's I think- great when it culturally, when it comes from the top down, then, you know, it's rude if you go 28 minutes in a 25 minute meeting. Uh, it's hard to that kind of thing to come bottom up. But I mean, that came from from Ryan Schneider all the way down and uh, very much appreciated. I can't say that I've been able to not in fact, this morning was a no meeting Friday and I had a lot of meetings. But <laughs> but we were internal meetings, you know, yeah. Uh, yeah. But that, that's been helpful too. Yeah, it's easier if it's internal. You can everybody kind of is playing by the same rules. Yeah. When you have clients or outside folks that are not. What are you gonna do? Yeah. yeah. It's, only time. <laughs> it's, only time. it's the only time it works yeah. out. Um, the other piece I had, I love what you said about um, learning how to say no, and it reminded me of um, an exercise that uh, I, I remember being given out. I can't remember who did it. It was at a at a conference about where uh, they had people practice saying no to people in different ways like oh, that doesn't work for me or um i don't i don't think i can do that or like they just had, had, had did a role play exercise where they did that and i remember the take home exercise which i thought was super cool was uh to 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 on purpose disappoint 10 people in the next two weeks oh. so just oh. on purpose so you train that muscle of saying no of being like because i think what happens when you really want to to, to do work with people, you just say yes, because you want to make them happy, right? But yeah. so you have to train that muscle of, uh, of, of saying no and disappoint. So it's on purpose, go disappoint 10 yeah. people. Well, you know, it's funny, you just reminded me too of something that, you know, kind of I've, the last few years has been something I've worked with my teams on. Um, and especially when you're in a, a service role, right? And so we're always like, people are always coming and asking us for things. And um, I don't mind if people say no, but I'm really offended if people lead with no. And right. yeah, right. And so it's like, you can say no to me, but like, I, you've got to be opened to what I want. And then you can come back to me and say, but if you know, you all, we all know those people, right? That they're, they're difficult to work with because they always lead with no. And, yes. you know, and it's yes. just, it's a frustrating dynamic internally when you have those people. But I will tell you that nobody that works for me works that way because it's not, it's not a philosophy that I believe in. And you can say no, but we need to have a reason for it. It can't just be, you know, yeah. you got to start with me. It can't be your starting position is no. It has to be, yeah. tell me more about what you're trying to get done. Yeah. So. But you, you know, and this, another Mike Saberism <laughs> is, you know, he always used to tell me, you teach what you allow, right? Mm -hmm. And so I, I uh -huh. try to model the same thing. And so if I am, you know, behaving a certain way, so if I do, um, if I constantly say no to people or let people say no to me, or to your point, Jack, if I let people take advantage of me, I'm teaching other people that they can treat That's me. Okay. Like, right. And yeah. you know, I don't have kids and I don't, I can't imagine how you guys do it. <laughs> and, you know, because it's just, it's a, it, I can't even imagine, but I'm sure that my children would have um, not run over me. That's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> well, I that quote. I've got a, that's another great, great quote from today. You teach what you allow. That's a keeper. Yeah. Um, I think all my good quotes probably came from Mike Staver, so we'll have to quote. <laughs> we'll have to give him credit. <laughs> well, what, what's interesting, I think, about the servant leader and the saying no and all that, just to throw this in, is, you know, there's a fine line between servant leadership and then people pleasing. And mm -hmm. so it's really understanding the distinctions. And I'm going to plug this book for a minute too, because so many things that we're talking about, but this How Women Rise book, um, mm -hmm. the author is Sally Helgeson. And um, Aaron Coops was the one who uh, referred it to me. And uh, so it talks a lot about all of this. And so I don't know if, if you're up for a good read, I think that's a good one. But, you know, when we notice we're people pleasing, then that can kind of change everything versus being really grounded in 
you know, why we're doing things and why we're asking things versus just saying yes to someone so that we feel better because generally we know that like, oh, we probably should say no to that, but we say yes because we feel bad. It's funny you say that though, because thank you, Kelly, that's awesome. And I think it all comes back to the point that we had at the beginning about confidence, because the difference between people pleasing and being a servant leader, it, a lot of it has to do with confidence. And so if you don't, if you, you know, you don't leave with no, and you then like hear what people's change, whatever it is they want, and then you have the ability to then go back and say no, because you're confident that you've done your work and you know your research and you know why something could or couldn't be done. And then you can say no to people. But um, I think it's uh, confidence is a, is a big, big, I can't even underscore it enough. I think if, you know, again, back to your kids, but like the one thing you can do is build confidence in your kids because it makes them so much more, you know, like get through life with such a shield. The inter another interesting dynamic I've recently been studying too is how courage, sometimes when we're doing something new, it just takes courage. And then once we do it, we get the confidence, but it's also the difference between confidence and then self-confidence because you can have self-confidence and still not be confident in something that you're doing. Does that make sense? That makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. That's interesting. Yeah, yeah. I think so too. So then sometimes it's like, okay, I'm going to need courage while I'm learning this new thing. And yeah. then I'll be confident in the skill, but I can still have self-confidence, meaning I know I can do it even though it's scaring the crap out of me or whatever, you know, whatever the adjective is that goes along with the learning the new thing or doing the thing that scares you. You're right, though. If you don't have courage, you'll never try to do the new thing. And so you'll never challenge yourself to grow. Um, yes. You know, I think uh, I, I'm in such a place right now where I made this big, scary change. And I mean, yeah, I stayed in real estate and yeah, it's similar, but it's so different. And, um, you know, I, it's been terrifying, <laughs> you know, but I'm not afraid to say that because it's just true. And, you know, yes. I've screwed up and I've learned, I've learned so much. I mean, like my brain hurts at the end of every day, <laughs> uh, which is, I, I'm, I, I also, I feel alive, you know, it's really yes. fun. I, you know, it's, thank you for sharing that because I think it's good for people to hear that we can be terrified and it still doesn't mean that we don't do it or that we're not good at it. And yeah. um, I love the notion of that you're doing something terrifying and it's, you know, you just feel more alive than anything, which is great. Yeah, I, I keep joking with everyone that like the acronyms, like there's acronyms for everything and I don't know what anything means. And so I'm not afraid to just be like, tell me what that means. And every now and then it's like net present value. I mean, it's like things that I should know, but because I just assume they're like a religi specific acronym. I'm, oh, well, I knew that. <laughs> right. You're like, I know what that means. I didn't realize. I thought it was some like secret language. But you can't be afraid to look a little foolish too. True. You know? Because that, I mean, that's kind of what courage is, I suppose. But um, absolutely. Hmm. Well, yeah. as we're coming to the end of our 45 minute plans time for fireside friday so i just i think it's been an incredible discussion it tells you that when uh when we do have a happy hour available to us again we should avail ourselves of that um because I, I think we could talk for hours and hours um before we go i have one resource i wanted to send out to people that i i really enjoyed it was related to this month's theme which is um usa today did this fantastic series on uh, it's it's a, a, a century of, uh, of women leaders, and it's just fantastic. Uh, and they went through it's women of the century. Uh, I'll post it into the chat. But if you ever need to be inspired, I was inspired there because they have broken down. You can go to your state, and they have these are the women that, of the century for your state. And they had like Margaret Jordan and a bunch of people here from Texas, and you know and, and the, the John, you know uh, LBJ's wife, and all of the different Johnson family members. There's all these people that are super inspiring. So go check it out. It was, uh, it's awesome. And it's a really great, it's a better, like I stumbled upon it. And I was like, oh, this is incredible. Somebody really put some sweat into this. So I uh, just wanted to share that. And before we close, um, I'd like to know any, uh, any, you know, closing thoughts or coaching or things, things for our audience out there. We, by the way, we held the audience the whole time. We had like all these people stay on the full time. So this has been a good conversation. Obviously, anything to uh, to pass on to this group while we've got them. Uh, Stephanie. Yeah, sure. No, no. Thank you. And thanks, guys. This is fun for me too. I love doing this, and not as scary as I thought it was going to be. So thank you for making it easy for me. Uh, I would say a, a, a point we made kind of lightly, but that's really really important. It's kind of this concept of top down and building a culture where there's awareness of giving people opportunities. 
And that's so much of what we're seeing right, right now with all these industry initiatives around not just women, but again, minorities. I think when, you, when you're conscious and you're talking about not everyone having equal opportunity, whatever that is, it becomes part of your culture and it becomes like a seatbelt, right? And you, you don't, you later you think, how come we never do this to begin with? But mm -hmm. when you have conversations about it, you talk about it, you make it tangible and you make it part of your culture. And I, I think that we just all need to commit to doing that more. Um, and then some of this will happen more naturally. That's really great. That's really great. Kelly, anything for you before we wrap it up? Uh, well, I just want to thank Stephanie, and um, it's good to get to know you even a little better. And I think this conversation has been, has caused me to think more. It's been a while since I really thought about servant leadership and what that means and really bringing up, I think, consciousness in our conversations and our relationships. And, you know, it, it conjures up for me coaching and um, investing in people and building relationships and all of those things that I think make us not only successful, but help us make the next generation or help them be successful, not make them successful and really just to help our organizations be stronger. So thank you for sharing all of your insights. My pleasure. Yeah, we're so glad to have you today. This has been a fantastic one. So uh, thank you for helping us close out August on a, on a high note and uh, look forward to seeing you at, at future events, both uh, virtual and in-person one day and uh, we'll, we'll do it. So again, I'm in bye. whatever you guys need. <laughs> thank you so much. Have a good Friday. Bye you guys. Bye. Take care. Thank you.